So now in view to time constraints, I'm just moving forward into the round table discussion and I'm asking the more or less to, or the, the participants the, um, of the panel discussion today to, uh, to be ready to answer to some specific questions. So what we try to do is of course, then we had a look at the, um, at the chat. So we saw there were a few questions coming in. Uh, first, the questions were uh, addressing um, the case of uh, Christian. So just just an, an entry point, because I was referring at the beginning and in my introduction to an EC study, which is currently under the uh, preparation. The study is in layouting phase, so it means we expect the study to be published in the in the coming weeks. And of course, we will inform about the publication uh, via the the, our common channels like um, the news, the newsletters from the help desks. So then, Christian, please um, be prepared. There were if, two questions which you may answer very briefly. One of them was um, uh, asking: Did the political situation in Myanmar have had any impact on the Orkan success story um, in, in in China? And maybe together. Also, uh, there was a question about the um, the investment return time for a, a potential customer buying the product. Could you please address the two questions? Okay. Um, the first question, political situation, <clears throat> to be honest, I don't know. Um, this big project was in the year 2018. Um, so it's basically already up and running. Um, obviously, back then, it was the political situation of the opening of the country towards Western uh, partners, Western technology. Um, however, to be honest, right now, I don't know what's the situation. Um, well, period. I could only speculate on, on, on the political situation or on the impact of the political situation, which, which I don't know right now. Sorry. Um, second question. Um, sorry, Jörg. <laughs> could you repeat second question, please? The question was about what is the investment return time oh, yeah. for a customer okay, yeah. buying the product? Yes, yes, <laughs> thanks. Um, obviously, uh, it depends as usual in terms of uh, technology. Um, for example, one of the main driver is um, the temperature of the exhaust gas. If the temperature or the exhaust water, whatever you have as medium, um, is below 100 degrees, obviously it's it's not so efficient. You can still use it, uh, but then return time is higher. Um, if the temperature is higher, return time goes down and it can go down to as low as, for example, one and a half years. So it's really a return time is depending on the individual situation, but it can be really uh, in good situation. It can be below two years. And so obviously um, every investor will see it as a great investment with such a low uh, return, uh, time on return, return of investment. Thank you, Christian. Maybe another Trying question. To be brief. <laughs> um, yeah, another question. I mean, you mentioned in your presentation that it is very important to find the right local partner for internationalization strategies. So tell us how Orkan managed to do the first steps in teaming up with uh, strategic business partners from China. Um, yes. Um... Obviously, I mentioned uh, for a small startup, it's it's very difficult uh, to approach China to make the decision, should we go in there or not? Uh, then they made the decision uh, to, to team up with a partner. Obviously, then the question is how to find them. Um, what they did and, and what really worked well, they took part in official delegation trips of Bavarian or German ministries. Most of the countries that have official delegation um, visits from one country to another um, often uh, led by the Minister of Economic Affairs or whatever, they took part in these missions and this really worked as a door opener. Um, they uh, uh, got in contact with many people and because these were this official ministry delegation, it was sort of the first quality check. Um, they, they met sort of trustful partners there and then obviously this was the door opener and then came the, the subsequent steps of basically um, talk about the technology, having the NDA, which is always important, um, visits and, and counter visits, and then basically build up the trust, which is necessary to go in there. Uh, but I would say taking part in these uh, official delegation visits was very, very helpful for Orkan. And this would be a great advice, um, I think, for other listeners in a similar situation. 
Thank you, Christian. Now we move to Daniel. We move to Daniel. Daniel, I mean, uh, my first question would be that uh, in the first two presentations we, we had today, we, we learned that an integrated local innovation ecosystem with players such as research organizations, universities, TTOs, or business advisors will establish favorable conditions to bring clean tech clean tech uh, results from the lab phase to the business. So am I right that this also applies to your case uh, in, in, in Porto? It was a very yes, important yes. factor. Yeah, you are absolutely right. Uh, if you remember from my presentation that the technology born at the University of Porto and, and the startup was founded and they are still connected. And that is very important. So after these uh, 18 years, uh, they have master and, and PhD students together. Uh, so there is this exchange of know-how. It's critical because the SMEs have limited resources for R&D departments and they have no, no uh, financial resources to, to have all this knowledge to solve the problem of just a customer. So there is a, a synergy between the university uh, and the company. But uh, I should add something because all of you are aware from the triple helix and sometimes there, there is a missing partner here. In this case, they are partner, but, but uh, sometimes we have uh, a, a company, we have the university, but it misses the business inside a company that will further develop and commercialize the technology and not a company that is a, a final user. So I think that the ecosystems are completely very uh, completely essential in this process also to bring the, the venture capital inside the and, and the final word is share your success don't try to do the, the all the way alone and and be part of a group and and share your knowledge and success okay thank you uh, a second question i mean you you addressed actually the challenge of um, IP identification and IP management within collaborative research and innovation projects. We see that in many cases, for example, from research and innovation actions or innovation actions funded in Horizon 2020. And we're going to see that even more in the future in Horizon Europe. So this, the, what we see here is the main challenge is that usually such collaborations result in joint ownership situations as you presented in, in, in your case. So, um, um, and you obviously managed to challenge this uh, successfully. So um, referring to your specific case or in your overall capacity as a European IP help desk ambassador. So what are good practices to protect, to share and to exploit IP created in such collaborative environments? Okay, yeah, very simple, uh, build trust. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is not easy in the, in the, real, in the real world. Uh, my piece of advice to you is to have a crystal clear communication with our partners from the, the very beginning. Be aware that for some of them, they are not used and have a kind of afraid of IP issues. So uh, we have a, a dual role of educate them and guide them uh, along the process. Okay. There is also um, a common mistake and confusion between the ownership and access rights, even in the cost context of the European projects. So many times companies think that they own, they, they must own the IP, but they just want to have access for a certain uh, application or under certain terms. And, and many times the example of the orange is, is very, very useful. So many times, uh, you want the juice, the others want the peel, and both parties are, are, are happy with that. And if once if we split the orange, maybe anyone could do nothing with, with that. So, and summing up and, and connecting also with the previous question is, is to, to be aware that in, in some of these projects, they also they miss a lot uh, a company that can exploit, in fact, the technology. In the, in the case of the Predator, uh, we have a, a very powerful user because they have a, a very big facility. So the, the, the app scaling and the demonstration is done, but then we should be connected and have a, a common strategy to go to the market and to find a, another partner that helps us to bring a product or a service based on the predator technology. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Then Welcome. Then, as this is a really our 
a quick, a very quick uh, round of um, of discussion. So we move then to to Benoit. Um, Benoit, so from your experience in the Southeast Asia IPSME help desk. So what are the most relevant considerations when when planning an IP strategy for entering into the Southeast Asia market? Okay, thank you, uh, Jor, for uh, sharing the, this question, this concern. In fact, it's a very uh, frequent question that we hear uh, for webinars and for so when we are contacted by the well, through the helpline of the help desk. So uh, IP in terms of PUBG is uh, key to competitiveness and uh, for the business uh, in the global economy. It's uh, would say it's a for securing a return on investment in innovation, creativity, reputation. And it's uh, like one of the most uh, relevant part for uh, SME and uh, specifically uh, EU SME when it's uh, designing to uh, go uh, abroad. Uh, it's uh, also like a very important source of cash flow and uh, revenues uh, for an SME because uh, they will be able to uh, set some uh, uh, licensing deals or even uh, IP sales or other kind of agreements involving uh, intellectual property. Um, I would say that based on uh, our webinars guide that all available on our uh, websites of uh, the help desk, uh, I would share some um, tips uh, maybe on how to use and implement an efficient uh, IP strategy in uh, Southeast Asia. First would be uh, identify your IP assets and know which one you want to protect or which is not uh, like relevant to protect. Prioritize the protection uh, accordingly to your uh, specific strategy. The third uh, tip, for example, would be uh, assess the strengths and also the vulnerability of your business and set it according to the countries of interest you have in mind. Uh, still discussing about uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, fourth one would be um, register your core intellectual property rights as soon as possible, just don't waste because uh, as you may uh, probably know or not, in Southeast Asia, it's the first to file system uh, in most of the countries of the region. Um, another tip would be uh, uh, thinking about uh, online protection and online protection grant uh, systems. Uh, it's very efficient. Uh, you can uh, detect uh, some counterfeiting canals and sources. Um, I would also add uh, maybe preparing your contracts, uh, like written contracts, uh, trying to set some uh, very specific uh, non-disclosure agreements in uh, English, but also in the local language, because in Southeast Asia, we have a very uh, different uh, languages. And so it's always good to have like a local translation. And uh, finally, uh, always trying to get the help and contact support of a uh, IP intellectual property local expert. And this person uh, will be able to further explain you the specific policy, the specific practice rules, and help you to guide and also connect uh, with uh, the um, national IP office. Uh, thank you, Benoit. Maybe just a very last question and a brief answer to that. I mean, uh, we know that sometimes European SMEs try to, to work on, when, when it comes to register IP, try to work on the registration themselves. Would, what would you recommend them? Do they need to hire a lawyer or would you also give them assistance to find the most appropriate one? Well, in, in fact, uh, most, uh, in most of the countries of uh, Southeast Asia, uh, local registration is necessary to protect your IP uh, because I told it was the first to file system um, and there are specific rules. It's not like a global territory. You have to apply on each, ca each country from each country, for, for example, for trademarks and patents. Um, so I would say that, yes, uh, generally it would be better to uh, contact a IP expert, mainly because uh, before some uh, local uh, IP offices, uh, the representation is mandatory. Uh, well, you have to do, you, you do have uh, to uh, appoint a local representative. But the second step would be that before some uh, IP offices, you, there's only the local language which is accepted. So if you are a, a USME, you will have to go through translation. And uh, this can also be uh, 
brought to you by the help of the IP local expert. But I would point out that some uh, of the offices, of IP offices in Southeast Asia are now uh, more familiar with English. And for example, you see uh, Brunei, Cambodia, the Philippines, Singapore, and uh, you can also uh, find applications in English. And this is the same for the websites, it's slowly evolving. And now you can also uh, see a lot of information available on the websites it's also in English. Okay, thank you. Then, then we move to the next uh, panelist uh, representing uh, the Latin American help desk. So Cesar, I mean, um, what are the most common difficulties or, or barriers that uh, European companies face um, when they reach out for Latin America or get in contact with the Europe, uh, with the Latin American help desk? Mm, that's a tough question. Yeah, I may have to take a look on the speaker notes if I may, but no, it's, it's not that tough <laughs> because um, many companies come to us and addressing the very same kind of question. They're trying to take the leap and they don't know how to do that. And the very first barrier or problem they encounter is that they cannot do that themselves. And Latin America has a, from a regulation and business point of view, a very different ecosystem. And starting from the beginning, uh, online access is not as normal as it is in Europe. You cannot just simply go to the website of the intellectual property office and file the present the application if you have no local domicile there. So that will be the first barrier. You need to have, you need to have a local domicile, but wouldn't make any sense to be able to send this application if you don't really know the specificities of the local regulation. No sense. As really good, well appointed, uh, Eugene Sweeney in the chat, you need to have strong rights to do this. And if you just haven't, if you're just doing that yourself, maybe you're not identifying the weaknesses of your right. And at an ultimate stage, you would be rejected and you would have lost time and money. So having your own, uh, doing that on your own is not that easy. You need to go, if you rely on local experts, even in, in some countries, you don't have even online resources. You need to go that physically. So this is a one of the main concerns. The second one is that you don't are not using your own language as the Madrid system, for instance, as we mentioned that during our case study presentation, is not so well spread. You need to go country by country, which means translations, a lot of the documentation, and you need to rely on local experts again. So it is not as accessible as they wish. And they have some specificities. And for instance, there is no on protection for non-registered design, which is kind of a shock for those companies of the fashion industries, which are relying on this kind of, of protection form that in Europe protect, provides from automatic protection, whereas in Latin America, you're absolutely naked. Either you register or you can be absolutely exposed to legal copies. And finally, I would say that the last uh, one is counterfeiting. It is not as high as one can imagine. It is not so drastic but it is a concern. And if you don't have any IP rights registered and you're starting with a low profile saying, I'm going to go there, see if it works, and then I'm going to register, it may be simply too late. Once you're in, people are going to see if your product is really worthy and they're going to copy immediately. So if they don't protect that, they're screwed. Thank you very much, Cesar. I mean, there's just not enough time for, for more questions. There's only one and which one I would like to address to Nicole because that's a one uh, we received in the in the chat. Um, and it is about, um, yeah, a problem I think which refers to uh, all the international cases that SMEs usually do not have the experiences or the financial means to deal with infringers. And the question here would be are, how could uh, SMEs um, adopt strategies and best practices to monitor and to deal with potential infringers, taking into account yeah, the challenges SMEs usually face? Is there any good, uh, good tip, good recommendation how SMEs could, um, could um, manage this challenge? 
maybe Nicole or Benoit, could you address this question? Uh, yes, for Japan, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer. So the the JPO has a specific desk for SMEs too that, that, that brings some support. Might not be so easy because of the language to directly communicate with them, but if there is a Japanese language specialist in the team, then it might be an option to reach out to them and see whether there is some support that is possible to get there for free. And another option, if there are some funds around uh, with working together with the local council and making a good deal that the local council is keeping an eye out for competitors and infringers is another option, but that will cost them a little bit. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. It did because it really was one one of the one of the questions in the in the chat. And I think what you the, the case you presented for Japan is also something we could uh, definitely also transfer to to other international uh, territories. So I mean, I, I'm really sorry. I think we we could keep on talking for hours, but uh, I have to um, to to move and to pass the word over. To Simon for for the for the conclusion. So from my side, so very very much. Thank you very much for all your great presentations, your reflection points, and the takeaway messages in this short round of discussion. If there are any further questions from the audience, please get in contact with our colleagues from the from the help desk. So please make sure. I mean, this is directed to our participants and the audience today. Please make sure that you benefit from the large experience and the hands-on services to start or to grow your business. By this, I would like to hand over to Simon and uh, a big thank you to the panelists, to the experts for take that you took some time and you brought out this very interesting discussion. So please, Simon. Thank you, York, um, and thank you for co-moderating today's event. And I would also add uh, many thanks to all our presenters for their insightful contributions and, and for giving us the benefit of their, their knowledge and experience. I think it's fantastic to know that these help desk resources are available uh, to guide businesses from an IP perspective to make better informed decisions decisions which can be critical to enable them to be internationally competitive uh, and decisions which can be so important to ch achieving sustainability and long-term benefit from from innovations i think nowhere is this more relevant than for the transformation to a greener more digital and resilient industry and the help desk provide tools to support our industrial ecosystems in this transformation and reinforce their global competitiveness. If I may too, just add uh, or pick out a few of the key takeaway points. We, we heard from the Orkin case study, uh, which shows the importance of registration of IPR to gain credibility. Uh, from uh, Mark Peters and Benoit, uh, we heard about the crucial need for a sound IP strategy and what that can, tell, uh, that can entail. Uh, we also heard from Daniel, an example of why businesses need to use different types of intellectual property rights. And from uh, CIMO and Caesar, one of the first things we heard to do as a startup is register a trademark and that to license you need intellectual property rights. And we've also heard that the help desks are set up to focus and advise on strategies and practices uh, SMEs with all their financial and resource constraints can adopt in destination markets where rules and languages are different. In, back in 2019, the president of the European Commission said of the EU, we are not naive free traders and the help desks give access to guidance, knowledge and local experience on IP issues which can help our businesses avoid the pitfalls of IP naivety. So having said that, I would like to, to close uh, this event by encouraging all business support organizations in attendance to not hesitate and reach out to the help desks for free support and for SMEs to reach out for any questions they might have regarding the management of their IP in Europe or third markets. Um, so it just remains for me to, to thank you all for attending. Thank you.